Hi, my name is Joe Matty. I've been trapping for 35 years and I've run a fur buying business for 17 years in Fairbanks, Alaska. Over the years, I've seen a lot of professionally handled fur, but I've also seen a lot of good furs that were nearly worthless because of poor fur handling. Of all the things a trapper has to learn, proper skinning and fur handling techniques may be among the most important. How well or poorly your pelts are prepared makes a big difference in how much money you will get for your furs. Some years, it can even make the difference between being able to sell your pelts or not. It's been said that as much as 25% of the dollar value of Alaska's fur harvest is lost each year just because trappers aren't using the best available skinning and pelt preparation techniques. The purpose of this video is to show you how to prepare pelts so they will be more valuable in any market. This video will also show you how to skin fur bearers for the taxidermy market so taxidermists can use the pelts for life-size mounts or rugs. Proper fur handling begins on the trap line. Okay, a lot of damage is caused uh, right in the transport, right from the trap line with your furs. This sled is going to go miles down the trail, bouncing along, and it's real important how you pack your furs in a sled. Uh, what I like to do is, is put my snowshoes on the bottom, and that makes like a, like a unit so all the furs can kind of, all the animals I should say, can kind of bounce around go together as one unit and put a nice thick blanket down or an old sleeping bag, anything will work. Then obviously you want to put the heaviest animal in first. I got this wolverine in a conibear bear trap and it's frozen. The conibear bear trap is froze around him so you, you definitely have to take the conibear bear trap with him and wait until he thaws out and you put him in such a way that his claws aren't going to get banged against anything because that's the part that damages the most on a wolverine. Okay, we got some Martins here too. These are all caught in a pole set. They're frozen. You just find a good little spot to lay them down. You gotta keep in mind that these claws can damage another Martin that's packed next to them. So we'll just put a couple down in here somehow so they're not gonna ride against the edge of the sled. Okay, that looks pretty good. We'll just cover this all up nice. And we're ready to hit the trail. Every serious trapper needs a few basic tools to do a good job of fur handling. Most can be obtained from local hardware stores or mail order trapping supply companies. Uh, this is a fur comb. Uh, we use that for grooming. And this is a, a fur brush with a hooked wire like a dog brush, it's excellent for grooming. Uh, these are typical skinning knives. The smaller one is an excellent pointy knife for opening, like the leg cuts. Uh, this knife with a little more rounded tip is, is real handy for uh, just general skinning. Uh, the bigger knife is the shape of a blade we, we uh, tend to use for beaver skinning and for fleshing on the beam. Uh, the little green one's a scalpel, which is real handy for doing ears and real fine detail work. Right here are some uh, S-hooks that I use to hang off the chain for holding the animal up like a grapple. Uh, this is my tail puller. There's several different varieties of that. It's just for pulling the, the uh, tailbone out of the uh, tail hide. And these are push pins, aluminum push pins with a steel point about a half inch length. And they're, they're good for boarding the, the skins. This is a, just a simple spray bottle of water for spraying water wherever we need to use water. These are my pliers I modified out of a pair of linesman pliers for pulling toe bones out of the wolf and the wolverine. You'll notice on the inside here, uh, it's carved out with a die grinder and then rounded off at the tip. Uh, these really work real well for holding on to the toe bones. Uh, this is a homemade little hand flesher. Uh, it's made out of, of a quarter inch plexiglass and just sharpened on a bevel and it's good for touch-up work or you can actually do the complete fleshing job on a fox or a lynx with it. Okay, these are my tail splitting guides. It's an umbrella staves mounted on uh, a wooden handle and it's to be inserted into the shaft of the uh, tail after you pull the tailbone out and all it is is a little metal 
uh, channel groove that you put your knife blade in and you run the knife blade down to split the tail. Uh, this is my smaller of the two fleshing knives I use. Uh, we, use we generally use the con concave side and uh, it's very, very dull, about duller than a butter knife and it's uh, real handy for pushing the fat off the hides working on the beam. Uh, this is a real nice knife sharpener, uh, an oil bath type. It's real, real good for touching up your knives. And then just some paper towels, and that's about all the tools we, uh, you really need for skinning. Now let's take a few minutes to look at the construction and dimensions of some of the stretcher boards we will need for drying the pelts of Alaska fur bearers. We'll start with the wolf board. The wolf stretcher depicted is eight foot long and made of four inch wide material. It is adjustable at the bottom by spreading apart and placing a nail in one of the holes. It is also adjustable at the nose end by inserting different lengths of pins. Fully expanded, it should be nine and one quarter inch wide at 12 inches down from the nose and 19 inches wide, six foot down from the nose. Next, we have the Wolverine and Lynx board, which can be used for both species by adjusting the width at the nose with different lengths of spreader pins. Like the wolf board, it can also be adjusted for width at the bottom. This board is six foot long and made of two and three quarter inch wide boards. When used for stretching Wolverine, the boards fully expanded should be six and three quarter inches wide, nine inches down from the nose, and 10 inches wide, 40 inches down from the nose. For links, fully expanded, it should be five inches wide, nine inches down from the nose, and nine and a half inches wide, 40 inches down from the nose. Fox boards are five foot long and are made of two inch wide boards. Fully expanded fox boards should be four and one quarter inches wide, nine inches from the nose, and nine inches wide, 36 inches down from the nose. The Martin and Mink boards depicted here are the solid type and are used with a belly stick or wedge. Martin trappers need two different sizes of Martin boards, one size for males and a smaller size for female Martin. Female Martin boards can also be used for mink. The male Martin board is three and one half foot long and is made from one half to three quarter inch soft wood such as cottonwood or basswood. It should be two and three quarter inches wide, nine inches down from the nose, and four inches wide, 24 inches from the nose. The female Martin board should be three foot long. It should measure two and one half inches wide, nine inches from the nose, and three and one quarter inches, 24 inches from the nose. Mink taken in the lower Yukon Kuskokwim Delta are traditionally stretched more narrow than other Alaskan mink. Boards for Kuskokwim mink should be three and one half foot long. They should be two inches wide, nine inches from the nose, and two and a half inches wide at 24 inches. One size of tapered belly stick is used for stretching all marten and mink. It should be three foot long, tapered from one inch at the thick end down to a quarter inch at the tip. Okay, we're going to skin this Martin. It's a, uh, an average size male Martin, and we're just going to skin it for garment use, uh, not for taxidermy, just for how you'd normally skin for preparation to sell to a fur dealer or, or to uh, have it tanned and make something with it. The first thing I, you can see, I got my legs covered up with an apron, and I'm going to put my knees together tight, uh, and this is the position I use to, to do my initial cuts. I just hold the pad, the paw here between my thumb and forefinger, and then I poke the knife right about through the center of the pad, just like that, and then I hold the knife upwards a little bit so I could just slide it right underneath the skin and aim it right straight down the leg, right straight towards the, the vent opening. And I only want to cut about that far. And we just switch her over like this and uh, do the other foot the same way. Let's get the knife in. You can lift it up. It's easier if you can keep the knife in 
underneath the leather. If it pops out, then you have to start all over again and it's a little more difficult. So you just get about that far and that's it. Then you lift him up, open your knees and pinch his head between your knees, put the body over, over its back, and then this exposes the front leg real nice to do the front leg the same way. Poke the knife in the middle of the hand, like that. Lift up a little bit, and you have to feel your way through and just make that cut. And I, I just pulled my knife out about an inch from the body. Okay, just flip them over like this. Still got the head between my knees. Poke the knife in. And just feel your way right up the base of the leg until you stop about there, about an inch from the body. Okay? Now, you just have them kind of belly toward you, and you just grasp him just below the shoulders and just roll his lip back like this and then take your finger and, and thumb and just sort of pinch, pinch his lip like this to, to give a, a place for your knife to begin. And you just take the point of your knife and just give it a quick little poke right there to start it. And then you do the lower jaw, you just slice it a little bit. It's pretty hard to cut through the actual leather. It'll, it'll cut and separate it from the jaw much easier than to turn the knife over, put it right back in the same hole and just slide it right up the upper jaw. Okay, just gonna turn him over here like this and do the other side of his head the same way. Poking the knife in, slicing up the upper jaw this time, putting the knife back in the same spot and doing the lower jaw. Now we're gonna do the lower jaw and the way I do that is I just sort of pinch it right here enough to get the knife underneath all the way through to the other side and then get my finger under here and just sort of saw it a little bit use the, by twisting the knife, I can raise the lower jaw until I get my finger under there pretty good. And then, you don't have to be fussy about the lower jaw. In fact, you can even cut the lower jaw off completely if you wanted to. I generally don't, I don't know why. Just like that. Then I pull on this a little bit and just clean it up here a little bit like that. And then I pull it out again and you can see right down here, the meat along the, the, along the cheek is still adhered to the leather. And I'll just take the point of my knife and just sort of get it started. You can see right there it's a little bit cleaner. I'll do the same to this side. Just use the point of the knife. The knife has to be very sharp. Just scrape it a couple of times and it comes out disattached from the, from the hide. And I turn it around again because I am right-handed. And then I just pull his upper lips back like so until I can get to the nose cartilage and just saw right through the nose cartilage. Like that, all the way around, right through. Then I can get a hold of the nose and start and with the, this part of my knuckle, I can push against his forehead and just kind of get a good pull on it. And then I can, you have to have a good pull so you can aim your knife towards the skull and just make your cuts, just sort of trim it up like that and then get a hold of it real good and pull down and hard and then you can work the eyes. You can see the eye socket here. Try to get both of them down to some point before you try to pull it all the way off. Pull real hard here and just slice and the eye comes out nice and clean. I'm pulling real hard with my left hand and just slice. Now we're ready to hang it up. Okay, now we hang them up a uh, little S hook here and we just poke it in right underneath the lower jaw and that's a real good place to hang it. And then just pull by the lower jaw and the nose and just pull down with it, both hands at the same time. And this little bit of meat we can trim off later on, but you can see how nicely it exposes the ear. You just pinch it between your thumb and forefinger and just cut it off close to the skull. Spin it around and do the same to the other side. Okay, and then take your index finger and put it underneath by the ear and pull down, like hook it and pull down, and that gives you a, a nice clean place to cut a little bit. Just touch it with the knife. Same thing here. Just touch it with the knife while you're pulling. And then you can do the same with the lower jaw. Use two fingers for the lower jaw. You can see where that shows exactly where to cut, and just touch it. Be careful you don't cut through the leather. And once you get that, then you put your knife down, and then you just use your thumbs underneath here and your fingers to just push down. Just push straight down all the way around until you can feel the adhesions 
breaking loose and you want to stuff your fingers right down until you feel the upper shoulder joints. You want to get it good and loose. Okay, once you get to there, then you just take the, and just sort of hook it with your fingertips and just pull it right down till you're exposing both upper shoulders. And then you can take one finger on each side of the shoulder and just pull down a little bit, and then pull down a little bit here. And then you take each, you take your thumb and you take the, the foot and just stuff it back up underneath the leather, just like that, okay? Now, you can use your thumbs right in here to flesh with. You can see how I'm sort of scooping the meat and pushing it back onto the animal. And then using my lower thumb just to tighten it up once in a while here. And you just keep, take your time to do it good here. Don't be in a hurry to poke your thumb through. What you're trying to do is flesh it so you get all the meat stuck to the, car the, the uh, carcass instead of on the hide. And once you have your thumb through, then you can come through with your finger the other way and just pull it apart to start skinning the leg until it pops through. Now here, you want to make sure you have the leather behind your index finger even. You don't want it twisted around in a knot. You want to have it nice and even so you're pulling it evenly. Now this is the foot it was caught by, so I might use my finger in here a little bit to kind of pull on the sides because it was real easy to tear that off because the leather has been weakened by the trap. And then you hold it real tight here and just pull until you get the hide all the way down to the, to the foot. And if you're going to skin the claw joint, then you can just take your index finger and force it down, or your middle finger, and just force it down my, my tip of my fingers all the way to the head of the toes here. And then you can just push it inside out like this. But we're, we're, just, we're not going to go ahead and, and skin each toe. We're just going to cut it off there. So you don't really need to do all that. Then just do the other side the same way. Just you're fleshing it with your thumb. Pull down with this thumb, fleshing it with your thumb until you get it through, and then pull down. You notice how nice and clean everything is. There's no fat, no meat, anything on even along the legs. So you don't have to go back and flesh anything in after you're done. That's one of the real assets in skinning from this angle. Okay, and you pick your knife up again and just get your knife along the leather and you can just pull and saw and if you leave that much is real fine. That's real acceptable for garment use. Just like that. Put your knife down again and get a paper towel and get your fingers underneath here and you can see where the meat is still clinging a little bit. If you just take your paper towel and bunch it up it's got to be a dry paper towel and just push just like that. You can see it, it just pushes that flesh right off, and pushes it back onto the carcass. Once you start clean, the rest of the skinning will stay clean. Then just grab them by the nose and get a hold of the lower jaw and you can just pull it down over the rest of his body. Then I take my fingers and I hook against his nose, the upper head, and then I take my other hand and I try to hold that, this, you know, tissue, I try to hold on to it again to keep it skin and clean and to support it and then I just pull away. This is a very large marten so it's a little tougher to pull. Sometimes it's good to look, look around, make sure, sometimes if there's a scar you can tear, tear it real easy so it's good to look it over. Just pull it all the way down until you see the base of the tail, and you can see that your legs are ready to start skinning here. Okay, now what I'm going to do is just get a hold of the, the leather here and use my thumb right against his leg bone and just push away with the leg bone while I'm pulling here. And that gives me a good start. Then I get another grip and use my thumb to get through. Okay, and then the same thing, I come through with my index finger and just pull away until I can get the foot out through the, the cut that I made part way up the leg, like so. And I sort of hold on to this tight and I turn it around. I try to get my finger supported behind here. So I'm pulling on the leather on both sides simultaneously so I don't tear it. And I just pull straight down 
like so. And it just skins on both sides at the same time. Then I take my, my middle finger and push it right down the back of the hand until the, my tip of my finger is right here behind his claw. Then I use my thumb here and I just push with my thumb and turn the paw inside out on the, the base of the hand. And I just leave that until I get the other leg done and then do both feet at the same time. Here I, because I'm right-handed again, I just grab a hold of the leather down here and use my fingers here to pull up on the leg. And I can go in from the back. You could switch it around and do it from the belly side too, either way, but it's just uh, the flow that I use f to keep my time up, it just seems easier this way. And just push. Once you get your thumb in the joint, you can you got a good something to push against. And then I use my thumb again to flesh it. And you can, again, I want to point out how clean everything is. There's no fat. There's no way for any of the fat or meat to get on the fur where the cut is going to be. It comes out real clean at the bottom. And then I'll just go ahead and finish this leg by pulling. And then again, turning it around and making sure here that you're pulling on both. You can feel it with your finger pulling on the leather on both sides of the leg simultaneously with the same amount of pressure. If you pull it around the leg, you're going to tear it. Okay, now once you got your feet like this, now I'm going to back up a step. And I'll do the two end toes first. And I just get my knife in there, and I feel for the joint, and I just sort of lean back into it and give it one quick pull, and I just severed the joint. And it's easier to do the two end toes first. And then I make a little cut to saw right behind the toes here to expose the other three toes completely. And I use my knife just to pull with until I pull the last toe joint out. And then I get right at the claw joint. I, I sever the, between the toe joint and the claw joint. And there. This is actually. Uh, Plenty good enough for if you're going to want to mount the Martin for taxidermy, you'd want to do it this way too. Okay, now we just take them off the hook and we sit down here to finish them up. Put the carcass down like this and then we're going to just cut the, okay, uh, now that the penis is loose, we have to finish uh, skinning around the base of the tail and the best way to do that is just hold tight with your knees on the carcass and pull, pull here on the leather, and just right here, you could just, just touch it with the knife and pull. Again, touch it with the knife, and you can see these glands. It's good not to cut through the glands because it, it, it really has a bad odor. And uh, just pull and cut a little bit and pull and cut a little bit, just like that, and then pull it up about to here, and then stop. And then you want to uh, finish your cut down the, the base of the leg here, and the best way to do that is just put your thumb right in the cut so you can find the end of the cut here where you stopped and, and if you pull it tight it, it gives you a real good guide to make a nice straight cut and you use your knife this way because you don't want to chop the hair off so you just want to cut on the leather side and with a sharp knife you could just go right straight on down whoops right down to the vent opening just like that and I stop short so that way I can do this one with and I can tell exactly where I'm aiming at if I finish the cut all the way then it, it distorts my aim a little bit. And you want to get both of these legs cut the exact same way so they're even on the stretcher, like so, and then cut that loose. And then the only thing we have to do now is get our tail puller, which we just put around the base of the tail tightly, hold on here. It's good to have your hand covering everything up so you don't get uh, squirted, and just hold it tight and pull and it pulls the tail right out of the right out of the hide and you're done skinning okay and then uh, we'll go ahead in and I guess board this now uh, if you're not gonna board it right away then it's good to go ahead and put it fur out and freeze it like this and then when you have a, a, a stretcher available then you can uh, thaw it out and then turn it back around and stretch it. It's best to store it this way so it doesn't uh, freeze or burn or dry out too much while it's, while it's frozen. Okay, uh, now we're going to do a mink 
uh, the same exact technique that we, we showed you just now on the Martin. Uh, here we're not going to save the back feet or the front feet again. It's a little smaller mouth on a mink, so it makes it a little more difficult to get his body, uh, the mouth opening, pulled over his body. Okay, same deal as with the Martin. Hang him up by the lower jaw. I didn't do as clean a job around the cheeks on this as I did on the Martin here, so I'll just work on that a little bit first. There we go. Now pinch the ear off. get it to here and then you have to kind of squeeze the intestines forcing them up through the mouth opening here it's just he has a too small of a mouth to try to get pulled down as easily as it is to do the martin but if you just do this obviously it has to be pretty well thawed he's part frozen and you really struggle with it There it goes. Okay, now I'm going to try to get some of the fat adhered to the carcass, but it's really difficult on a mink to try to flesh while you're skinning. Yeah, see, it just comes off with, we're just going to have to flesh this off on the beam. You can see the amount of fat on a mink is much, much greater than a marten. Just pulling the leg upwards. Okay. Okay, now we're ready to sit down with it. Now, the one thing I'm going to do different on a mink that I didn't do on a Martin is I'm not going to make these last cuts now. I'm just going to finish skinning, getting the carcass off the hide. I'm not going to uh, finish opening up the legs. Uh, the, uh, what I'm going to be doing is fleshing them first. So the reason I'm doing that is so I don't get all this fat and stuff on the fur. All I'm going to do now is, is finish skinning them, trying real hard not to cut through the glands. A mink has these musk glands that, there they are right there. If you can avoid cutting into them, it helps a lot of the smell. Same technique, you just touch it with your knife and a lot of pulling. There's the vent opening. Use the tail puller, use my paper towel around that musk gland, and we're done skinning. Okay, I'm just going to spray a little bit of water onto the fur here, and what this helps to do is to keep it from actually singeing it while I'm fleshing. You don't need to soak it, you just want to get it slightly damp, and then we'll go ahead and turn it around again so we can flesh it. Okay, we're just going to put the mink on the beam here, and uh, it's still nice and moist. We don't need to wet it anymore, and we're just going to start at the, at the tail end, and we're going to flesh towards the head. I use the burlap bag here, too, and all that's for is to help keep the mink from slipping away while I'm pushing. I'm using quite a bit of force. Most of the force is actually, yep, there, see how easy it slips. Most of the force is pushing down away, not pushing down towards the leather. We just continue pushing right down here like this. And again, I'm not pushing against the mink itself too hard. Do a little bit and then 
roll them around on his side a little bit. We're just going to try to get the bulk of it off now, and then I'll flesh it a little cleaner. This oil here still has to get fleshed off. I just want to get the heavy stuff off first. Okay, now I can go ahead over it again and clean it up a little bit better. It's one of the benefits of not having the foot on here is you can flush right over the leg. Then I'll turn them around up here and uh, flush from the head down. Okay, when you get down to the head, you can use your knife like this to finish cleaning it up because it's hard to flush right over the ears. Just trim it. Like so and then uh, what I'll do is when I get this on the board on my, my actual stretching board I'll trim this up a little bit with my pocket knife or a little plastic hand flesher to clean up the head a little bit more. Now I'm going to try to get this last little bit of flesh off by the base of the tail and the hind legs. It's a little tougher to do, but it has to get, it's better to clean it up now before you open up that leg cut. Again, trying to keep all the fat and oil off of the fur because we're going to leave this on the stretcher fur in and dry it completely fur in and leave it that way. We're not going to ever turn it. And what I want to do is finish opening up the mink here at the base. Uh, basically you can make one straight cut all the way across both legs, but you need to cut this wedge out, sort of a triangle wedge, to open up an inspection window. So you can, the best I think to do is to cut right straight towards the base of the tail here, like so. This is a uh, either a mink board or a female Martin stretcher board, same size. I'm just going to put the mink hide over it. Pull it down tight and try to keep it straight on the board. And my next step now is to split the tail. We haven't done that yet. So I use my uh, umbrella stave piece of steel channel and arrange the tail so the base of the tail is up and put my knife in the groove and just with a sharp knife you ought to be able to just pull it right straight down and makes a perfectly straight cut right down the base of the tail. Okay and, and the other thing I'm going to do before I board it is I'm going to touch up look it over real good it looks real clean here but I can see right up here a little bit of uh, thickened grease deposit and I'll just use this little plastic scraper to break that up a little bit right there and I see I can roll the mink around on the board like this and I can see right over here it needs a little bit too. Okay now on a mink we, we measure a mink from the base of the tail to the nose so we want that to be the longest measurement. We'll just pull her down nice and snug and put our first two push pins right at the base of the tail here. Okay. Now we're going to take the hind legs and we're going to actually pull them and tack them alongside of the base of the tail here. We want the hind legs on the same side of the stretcher as the tail. And what this is going to help do is open up an inspection window so after it's off the board you'll be able to see the fur at the base of the tail. Okay, and then this part here, you just pull straight down and tack it in here also. You use a lot of push pins in a mink. You want the fur to look very dense at the base of the tail, so we're kind of gathering everything up 
and pleating it right near the base of the tail. in a uniform way. Now as far as stretching the tail itself, we want to stretch the tail very wide. We don't need to pull it down. We're actually pushing it up and even though it appears loose, you just try to make it as wide as you can. And what this does is it helps to make the mink look very densely furred. And they'll sell at a better price that way. Okay, then we flip it over on the belly side. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to trim this little flap now to, to make a, a bigger inspection window. Oh, about, about here, about halfway between here and the, uh, where the penis came through. You just make a little cut in the leather and just trim it. right down the leg like that. Okay, and then we're not going to tack, put any tacks at all on the belly side because we want this to shrink up, but we are going to put in a, a real narrow belly stick to help release the mink off the stretcher. Let's push that up like that, and we're going to leave that just like it is. The front, front legs you can just leave draped like this. The lower jaw, you could just pin that up a little bit like that. And we're all done. Uh, this is a male Martin stretcher, uh, and real simple. Just pull them right over the stretcher, and then we still have to split the tail. And I'm going to leave the front legs inside while I'm drying the leather, and then I'll dry the front legs after I turn the Martin fur out. So I lift them up here a little bit and pull the front legs down evenly so I can get my belly stick up in between them. Now we're going to split the tail with our tail splitting guide to insert into the tail shaft and you can see sort of a brown line which indicates the base of the tail. You want to get the tail adjusted so you're making your cut right up the base of the tail and you put your knife in the groove and just pull carefully towards yourself and that makes a perfectly straight cut right down the base of the tail every time. Okay, I wanted to point out at this time that uh, uh, all the fleshing took place while we skinned it. We didn't do any additional fleshing on this Martin. It's clean, plus it allows you to, to get a better stretch on it. It's uh, real, real stretchy this way. Okay, now as far as how much to stretch a Martin, uh, the most important thing is having the correct size board. Okay, uh, this is a a fairly large male, we ought to be able to stretch it down to about 25 inches after it's dried. But uh, the way to do that is, and a very important part, is to always pull at the base of the tail first. And I'm going to nail this right here at the very base of the tail with a couple of push pins exactly opposite one another. And then I'm going to pull everything else down to here. Okay? You want to do this first. Always do this part first and then set the stretcher up on the side and we're going to put the foot on both sides of the stretcher evenly. I'm not going to pull down on the foot at all. I'm actually just going to attach it about where it was hanging uh, by its own gravity and just putting one push pin on each side of the hind leg, flipping it over and I'll put another deal here and I try to match the legs so they're exactly the same length. Having it nice and neat and uniform makes it look like it's very professionally done. Okay, now I'm going to pull down on both sides of the tail, just grab by the hair here and pull this down and put a push pin. I'm pulling straight down, I put a push pin in there and then another push pin in here. Again, this is where the fur dealer or the auction company is going to measure from the base of the tail. So you want to have this nailed down secure so it can't shrink while it's drying. If you don't nail it, it's going to be an inch or two shorter than this Martin could have been, which may lose you a five or a ten dollar bill when you go to sell it. Now on the tail, I'm just going to do similar to what we did with the mink. Just pin in both sides of the tail all the way down. I'm not really trying to stretch it long. I'm more trying to stretch it wide, holding it between my fingers like this, 
and about every inch down both sides of the tail a push pin. The tails are used today in a lot of garments, a lot of real fancy garments, and a tail that's been dried flat like this dresses really nice or tans really nice and it's really usable for use in a garment. The basic principle of stretching anything is the same. We're actually stretching the same amount of pull in all directions. So the animal is stretched in a natural way. Uh, the hide looks just like it, the animal looks. Now, you notice how I pulled that around that push pin and I pin the leg right alongside the tail. Now I'll show you after we turn one what this does. It makes the marten actually look on two inches longer than he really is because when you look at the fur, uh, you can't see where the, the fur ends because you can't see the leather. It actually gives it the illusion of the marten being this long. And when you hold it up, it just looks like a huge marten, way bigger than it actually is. Okay, now we'll put a belly stick in. Find your way right between those front legs. Put your belly stick up all the way five or six inches past the nose. It makes it a lot easier to get the belly stick out later on. And we'll just pull everything down and stretch everything around a little bit. A few more push pins. That looks real good like that. Now here on the front legs, poke your fingers in a little bit and squeeze them towards each other a little bit. What this does is it brings that thin armpit fur around on the belly side, which makes it look more attractive on the back, which is the, the part that the fur buyer is going to be looking at the most. And then we can just pin this lower jaw up. And we're done. We'll put this out in the freezer, and then I'll bring one out that uh, has been drying frozen for several days, and we'll turn it. Okay, this Martin has been drying outdoors for about four days in a frozen state. You can feel down here, it's completely dry. And the fact that it's been fr frost dried or dried while it was frozen, it leaves the leather very supple. And you can feel down here at the base of the tail that it's a little bit of moisture still in the base of the tail, but that's okay. <clears throat> it's, it's plenty ready to be turned. Uh, the easiest way to pull these push pins is just give them a little twist. Uh, the, the stretcher, this particular stretcher is made out of basswood, which is an excellent wood for, for stretchers because the push pins go in and out so easily and they don't warp and twist on you. Uh, another good wood, local wood, is uh, Alaska cottonwood. It is excellent for making stretchers. All the push pins are out now, so we'll just push the belly stick out. Remember we left the belly stick sticking through the, the nose. You just push down on the edge of the table or the floor. It's a real easy way to get the belly stick out. Set that aside and pull the Martin off the stretcher. Now, again, it's slightly moist here. You can see it's not so over dry. That's the beauty of, of freeze drying. The leather is still very supple, even though it's, it's thoroughly dry. Uh, the easiest way to turn this now is just poke the lower jaw through, flip the nose around, push the nose right down through here like that, and use your finger. And the critical part is to hold it with your hand here so you're actually forcing everything right through your hand. And you can use your finger like this, or you can use your belly stick and get that into the nose and just pull it right through your hand, just like so. A lot of times, trappers will accidentally make a tear here. So that it's real important that you support this with your hand. You just actually pull your hand right over the top like this, and you'll never make a tear. You'll get it completely turned around without, it's real easy to rip it up the belly or along the, the side of the tail. Okay, now we'll flip these lower feet, turn those fur out, like that. And now we're ready to put it back onto the stretcher because we still have to dry the ears and dry the fur and the front legs. All we need now, though, is about five push pins. We'll just pin down the, the edge of each back foot. And 
then we'll use one push pin at the tip of the tail. Okay, and then real important is to always remember to put your belly stick back in. You just push it up until it's just getting a little snug, just like that. Okay, now I wanted to point out too, uh, the fur, this is the best time to get to groom the fur because the fur is still slightly damp and you don't want it to dry in this uh, mixed up, twisted position because if it dries in this position, it's going to be really difficult later on to get the fur to, to look nice and straight. So we're going to go ahead and, uh, and spray a little bit of mist of water onto the fur before we brush it. Just a slight mist, not to get it too wet. And we're going to pick up our fur brush here, which is like a dog brush, and start at the nose, and we're just going to brush down with the grain, with the flow of fur, all over the entire fur, the sides, the belly, everything. This is going to really make it look a lot nicer to dry the fur in a nice, straight position. Okay, now that we've got it brushed down, I'm just going to get a hold of the Martin and support it here at the belly stick with my fingers, and then I'm going to tap the, tap the fur down on the edge of my table right over here. You've you got to be careful you don't whack it on the belly stick. If you do that, it's going to break, it's going to blow out the whole belly. So you want to hit right at the lower jaw here and just bounce it down like that, turn it over. Bounce it down a couple times and you see what's happening. It's essentially fluffing the fur back up so the fur is in a nice straight uniform way and it'll dry just like that. Now that it's all fluffed up, I'm just going to lean this against my chest here and I'm going to try not to touch the fur on the back and while I'm stretching the front legs out. All I have to do here, you don't, you don't have to repin the legs, although I've seen people do that before. You just basically have to get them stretched out. Some people put little boards up the armpit and, and spread it. I've seen people put push pins right through. It's, it's unnecessary. They'll dry real fine just like this. It saves you a little one extra step that way. It's different if you're going to do it for taxidermy. This is not for taxidermy. Just leave it just like that and it'll dry just like that. And then we're just going to set this off against the wall somewhere. Uh, and let it dry for about another day or so inside, maybe even two days, depending on the temperature of your cabin or whatever. Here's a couple of Martins here that have been pulled off the stretcher, and uh, they're thoroughly dry now. They're ready to, be, ready to be stored away until they're ready to be sold. And you can tell by the sound of them and the flexibility here on how nice they've been fleshed. Uh, Things I can point out is the fact that remember we pinched those front legs together. You can see the armpit fur, the thin armpit fur, is all on the belly side. So it looks nice and thick and full all the way down the back, and it makes a real, a real professional looking job here. Okay, I just wanted to take a minute now to, uh, to uh, go over some of the different ways that you can deal with problems like not having enough stretchers available, not having enough push pins, or time available. Uh, to deal with the drying process of these hides. Uh, this Martin here, we skinned earlier, and it hasn't been dried yet. It's still just raw green skin. Uh, it doesn't have to be put on a board right away. You can just lay it out flat, out in a frozen area, and, and freeze it in that position. It's very important to freeze it flat, fur out, so it doesn't freeze or burn. Uh, if you try to roll it up first, it's not going to freeze on the inside. It'll, it'll take too long to freeze. It, it may cause some problems with hair slippage. Also, this Martin here, we just boarded earlier. It's still very wet, and you can bring this out and dry it while it's frozen. This way, you can leave it out for several days or a week or even two weeks, and it'll, it'll be dry, but it, it'll never get so over dry that it's difficult to turn. You can bring it in at your convenience, turn it around, and put it back on the board. Uh, after it's boarded, it's best to leave them indoors because uh, you probably need that stretcher again. So uh, it's, it's best to just go ahead and, and finish the drying process indoors. But after it's dried, after it's like this, and it's off the stretcher, it's best to put it back outside and keep it in a frozen state. It's 
it, it just preserves it for a longer period of time because we, we just never know how long it's going to be before it ever goes to the tannery. Uh, if you have a, a martin in this state that's still furred in and you've, because of some unknown reason, you've let it over dry, you could just spray some water on it with a spray bottle and give it a couple of minutes to reabsorb the water and you'll be able to turn it without a problem especially on Martin. On some of the other animals, it's a little more difficult, especially Wolverine. If you get them over dry, it's very difficult to reabsorb them. Okay, here's a, a, a mink that was dried outside for about four days. You'll notice uh, the leather is nice and white. It's one of the, the added benefits of uh, doing a mink outside. They seem to dry a little whiter, and the leather is nice and supple. And if you happen to be trapping in the lower Kuskokwim Delta, where all the mink are fur out and sold fur out, then drying it frozen makes it a lot easier for you to turn it back around on the stretcher, like we showed you on the Martin. We'll push our belly stick out. Okay, now, we're completely done with this. I wanted to point out here uh, how we pulled the back legs around and tacked everything right next to the tail, and we could see you can see this nice section of fur very good, and that's the only piece of fur that the uh, fur grader needs to look at. And the fact that we sort of bunched everything together, you know, you can brush it a little bit if you like, straighten it out a little bit, but it looks really nice, and, it, and you can see the quality here. You can see how well furred it is just through that, uh, what's called an inspection window. Here's a uh, Kuskokwim mink that we have turned and dried fur out, obviously, and uh, it's been a long tradition that the, all the mink that's been harvested on the Kuskokwim Delta has been uh, marketed fur out. And I would, uh, I would say this is a good way to continue doing it. And, but, all, but this is a, a real good example of how a mink should be handled uh, fur in for the interior and practically all other sections of mink that I've ever heard of is that they've marketed them fur in. I just wanted to point these things out. I hope that'll help people with uh, some of the problems they have to deal with in a, in a practical way.